show you it. Yes, please, yes. <coughs> lottery. Woke to our hearing fireworks the day the lottery was born, but saw nothing, the sun already having risen. That afternoon we bought tickets, dripping with luck and walked up through the wreck in the graveyard and down to the river, secret and elated, counting our stash. That night we watched as someone else's luck came in, and next week, next week was when we found that car-struck dog outside the Claude, the one whose convulsive little body I picked up and placed to die in the gutter, its two eyes popping out like something being amazed in Disney. I haven't actually answered the question about um, okay, please. about the um, the, old, the death of an old mammal. Death, Eddie Carty was his name, an Irishman from County Wexford. He'd been over here, he came over as a younger man to work, as a lot of Irish people did, and uh, he never ever went back. And he lived in a single room, rather um, towards the end of his life anyway, a single room extremely stuffed with stuff and a two-bar fire always on winter and summer and the curtains drawn and the stench was extreme and he was uh, but a nice old chap and I'd do his shopping, we all would, we all would do sometimes do his shopping for him and bring him back his blue, blue pop and things that he liked and he'd give us a pound for a drink which we accepted and uh, then one day, I was living upstairs at the time, around the corner and one day, uh, of course, Eddie was taken to hospital and he, I went up to see him and uh, thought about his life and uh, he was unconscious and I wrote that poem as a sort of, uh, if you like, it's, it's a peon to a very, very ordinary life. When he died, he actually left quite a lot of money uh, I, in fact, I, I, I told the Wexford police that uh, he had died and he had relatives in Wexford and that um, perhaps they'd like to contact this family. I knew because I actually had got the address of his sister out of him before, some months before. And so they went round there and told them. And then, and of course, they had the body back in Ireland. So he went back to Ireland dead, mm -hmm. but never alive. <laughs> so, as Eddie, Eddie for you, that... Um, All of these characters seem to have brought out something in your poems from what I read you talk about in Iraq. Uh, really kind of very interesting but mundane things which often get overlooked, I think, in by other poets, but you tend to kind of bring them in to your poetry. Uh, I, I'm thinking of that poem, which uh, the name escapes me. Uh, it's the one uh, about uh, seeing <coughs> a dead, was it a dead dog by the curb uh, outside of a pub? Um, oh, that was with, uh, that's right, yes. That was, um, oh, the lottery, isn't it? Yes. That was with Girlfriend. Yes, and... Um, Beautiful poem. Yes, I like that one too. What's it called? Lottery, that's right. I yeah. think it is, yes. Yeah. Uh, that was the, the morning the lottery was invented, born. It was a strange morning because they had... Um, dawn broke over Cardiff and the lottery piece of people celebrated with fireworks but of course big dawn nobody saw them they, crack, they crackled over city hall to little effect but anyway like a lot of people we both bought tickets and like an awful lot of people we both imagined assumed that we would win <laughs> and, and so that day was just an account of that an account of that day Or else, this is a poem about uh, growing old and uh, whether we do it, um, as some woman said to me, uh, as a friend of mine said to me, um, what's that growing old? Growing old, disgracefully, that's right. <clears throat> to grow up, <clears throat> to grow old gracefully or disgracefully. Or else. <clears throat> Or else to up and chuck all this and live in gumboots down a lane with can openers and camping gas and nettles round the caravan. 
to up and off and be the sort who late on snowy nights is seen in knitted hat and army greatcoat crossing fields he does not own. It will be cold, the wind will whine, the frost will spin, the moon will stare, and all the stars above will shine like moth holes in old underwear, and sometimes in my pull-down bed, beside an oil lamp's smoky flame, I'll take down the city A to Z and bring to mind each friendly name. The, ro <coughs> the road not taken is the one that comes to haunt us in the night, with its perhaps I should have done, and what if I decided that? For if alone I lie at night a marooned among unfriendly farms, will I pull my dust bag tight against regret's goose-pimpled arms, and tremble for that foolish turn taken where the road divides, the one for going mad alone, the other bingo, free bus rides, pedicare and tight new teeth, and all that mustn't grumble thing until the fall or scalding bath, and then the geriatric wing. But then, when nodding by the news, with oval teen and custard creams, and matron bounces in and cries, bedtime boys and girls, sweet dreams, and plumps the cushions as I squeak, down halls a pledge and window lean, that all lead to the heart attack, and then the black cars in the rain, will I not wish I'd chuck the telly, to live on toast and nettle wine, shriven, saintly, somewhat smelly, in cords held up with baler twine, the sort of farmer comes across like that prehistoric alpine man, frozen solid in a foss, the wrong side of a keep out sign. Oh, here's that little lottery poem. Wonderful. Um, just coming from your uh, poem. The road not taken is the one that comes to haunt us in the night, with its perhaps I should have done, and what if I decided? And this is from All Else. Was poetry always a road you would have taken? Uh, probably. I remember having, having an interest in poetry very, very young. I was lucky to have um, slightly literary parents. And so there were books of poetry lying around. And also, um, which was quite influential, a little EP record. I think I've mentioned this before somewhere, that my father bought called Red Bird. So it's, it's up there on the wall, the top there, by behind the clock. And that was poetry by uh, Christopher Logue, read the jazz music, Ken Kesey Quartet, or Quintet, I think. And um, that was very, very beautiful. If I had a record player, which I don't, <coughs> I'd play it to you, but I, but I don't, so there we are. Two questions, me, which is sort of uh, the poets to have influenced you uh, in in a major or minor way, and and maybe anybody who influences you presently. The poet who I most found myself interest, influenced by was Derek Mahan, early Derek Mahan, a man who recently died. I was actually, um, I say, lucky enough. I, if I was lucky enough, I never made made, made anything of it because I never dared talk to the man. But I was uh, living in Belfast, and I saw him read there. He was reading with Jimmy Simmons and um, and uh, Frank um, Ormsby, who edited the Honest Ulsterman magazine. And um, uh, Jimmy Simmons sang his song with his curls waving, looking very handsome. And Frank Ormsby read his poems, and then Derek Matten came on, a small man with a very red face, and he was very, very, very drunk. He, he called us all middle, cl middle, middle class cunts. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I've always liked Derry Mahan. That didn't put me off him, the, though I, perhaps it should have done. And then I was in, taken, I, was, I, had, I left, left school years ago with no uh, A-levels. Uh, but um, I then applied to go to university in Ireland, having lived for a couple of years in Belfast, in the 70s this was. And they took me on without any A-levels, just on interview, because the University of Coleraine, the new University of Ulster, was uh, short of students. Nobody wanted to go because the troubles had just uh, were well underway by then. So they were keen to get people into the departments. And so they took me without... Um... And Derek Mahan showed up as poet in residence. And uh, we'd all see him looking very grumpy and riding the lift up to his office and sitting there alone all day and then stumping off home. 
But nobody, I don't, I think nobody, or nearly, I do think one woman have, uh, might have um, dared the lion's den, but most of us didn't. But it was good to see, I didn't know that, actually now on reflection, he was writing those really, some, some really good poems while he was there, um, about Port Russian, Port Stewart, and places like that. I don't know if he lived in Castle Rock, just round the, round the way, a lovely, on a lovely little railway line that trundles along from Coleraine, round the coast into Derry. There's a lovely, um, one of the nicest little train rides in, in the British Isles, I think. And, and what was the process? Did he take you through individual poems, um, or was it... I never spoke to the man. Okay, okay. No, no, no I never did speak to him. But, uh, uh, what is it? I, I, I think it's the... Um, the sense of great drama within a controlled and limited situation, suburban, suburban life, and yet, like uh, coming home, I think the poem's called when he's on a on a on a ferry to uh, Belfast from England, having not been home for a long time, finding Belfast so badly damaged because he was from Belfast, or just north of Belfast, so badly damaged by the bombings and whatnot, but. Um, which is a sort of, uh, well, a poem to change, a poem to um, his love for Belfast, his love for Ireland, I suppose. I know he did, he, he, he lived through most of his life and died in um, County Cork. Has, has Ireland inspired your poetry? Yeah. His Ireland. Um, not his Ireland. I don't, I race, I don't think I've mentioned Ireland very much in right. my poems. If I have, I can't really remember. I mean, I, I haven't come across anything, but of course you talk about uh, your uh, kind of your formative years in Ireland. Uh. No, no, I wasn't born in Ireland. I was born in London. No, I, I went to Ireland a lot as a my. I remember my when we first started as teens, teenagers. When we first started being interested in hitchhiking around, around places, my brother and I. He headed off with his fishing rod to Ireland, and I used to go to France. And one day. He came back from Ireland. In fact, there's a poem about that. It's in that book. I think, too. I think, yes, I, I, I have it. Yes, yes. Yeah. And he came back from Ireland and uh, he'd, t he'd tell me lovely stories about Ireland. Now the pubs were open until two o'clock in the morning. The police would come in and put their caps down and have a drink <laughs> after closing time and things like that, which I, I imagine, well, I certainly never witnessed it myself. It did sometimes happen in, happen in country parishes. But, um, I remember when I first went to Ireland, I got off the boat in uh, Rosslare and I didn't dare hitchhike in case nobody stopped. I wanted Ireland to be perfect. And I, I, it come, come, uh, influences. Now, I had a very Catholic childhood. We were uh, several o'clock mass every morning, school day or weekend. I served on the altar and I got a very thorough, we went to a convent uh, primary school. So nuns, in my mind, were associated with Ireland, which was heaven. Yes. <laughs> anyway, I did eventually start hitchhiking, and somebody almost immediately stopped and took me to Wexford Town or somewhere. And so it began, and I went, I spent a lot of time on the west of Ireland, and had a lovely adventure up in Belfast once with a girlfriend. And her father kicked me out for being a Catholic. This was early in the 70s, 73 or something. Kicked me, bought me a ticket to Dundalk and said, don't, don't try and hit shakes, it's too dangerous. But he found out I was a Roman Catholic and uh, bought me this ticket, drove me into town, put me down at the main railway station, Great Victoria Street. And so I got, a, got off the train, went to Dundalk. But he bought me the, the first town in the Irish Republic he bought me a ticket for. <laughs> but I remember I got off the train in Dundalk and a knapsack and longish hair. And uh, as I walked past the station bar, there was a man sitting outside and he stood and saluted. He clearly took me for a volunteer in the IRA. So I saluted him back, just like, a, a, you know, in a sort of, well, I, I accept that honour, thank you very much indeed, <laughs> sort of a way. I did have, I've not been published yet, but there is a new poem called, um, what's it called? The Free State, that's right which I hope somebody will publish sometime.
Do you talk so no, I went back up to Belfast yes. um, some years later to... I'd been abroad, that's right, I was in London, I'd been abroad, and I was drooping along, dripping along, dragging along Eastern Road, penniless, which is my usual state, and uh, looking one where, where I kept that, and I used to sleep out quite a lot in those days. Always on, always on the move, on the move, on the move. And um, I saw a sign saying volunteer today, CSV, it was big um, community service volunteers. So I went in and said, oh, oh, I'd like to volunteer, please. And she said, what, what, interest of, uh, what are your interests? I said, well, homelessness interests me. She said, well, go to the Simon community in Chalk Farm. So I walked up to Chalk Farm and uh, it was full of, uh, they clearly didn't like me. I spent a very awkward day there getting in people's way, green-haired girls and with nose rings, even back then, you know, very, very hip, hip little setup. And the, the homeless people they were looking after were kind and nice as usual. But um, I didn't fit in there. I went back down and said, I can't work there. This is the only other place you've got is Belfast. So thank you very much, I'll go to Belfast then. So uh, the game bought me a ticket to Belfast from Liverpool and that was me set up for the next five years in Ireland with the university on top of Belfast, yes. yes. And uh, I would have stayed, I would have been a Belfast boy now had I not fallen in love with a woman from England and uh, which didn't really work, which at the time it did work out later very satisfactory and we're still very good friends. But she wanted to go back to her old boyfriend. So I applied to go to Africa and stormed off to um, teach English in parts of Sudan for a couple of years. And but when, we, when I got back to, I went to Brighton, when I got back where she lived, I, um, we felt we were starting being lovers again, which was great until fairly recently. Well, not fair, until 20 or 25 years ago, perhaps, 20, 22 years ago, perhaps. But we're still good friends, uh, and that is about that. <laughs> <laughs>
I mean, poetry is just poetry. People come along and influence you, like for instance, um, Kate Tempest has been a great big influence on people, young people. And there are other people too, um, whose names escape me just for the moment. <laughs> Um, so yes, it's, uh, I'm bowled over sometimes by the brilliance that I read and hear. Generally though, and this is quite to be understood, it's, you know, it's, it's workaday stuff and um, good to hear and the, the spirit is good. And now we face things like this climate change and these terrifying prospects of floods and I read yesterday on a wall somewhere that Cardiff is the sixth most likely town, city to flood in um, the world. So it looks likely that we are going to get flooded. I happen to live on the second floor, so I, should, <laughs> I probably won't we'll get, we'll get wet. But I don't. A lot of people will. I, I sense a spirit of generosity in you in terms of uh, um, accepting of the neo poets and neo trends you mentioned uh, uh k tempest uh, um do you see yourself um at any point maybe in the future perhaps uh you know wanting to mentor any any younger poets or if, if, if i would i'm not i don't think i mean i would ever claim to be in that sort of position okay frankly i'm i'm i, I taught english but it's and i did do some teaching at barry college for a while in the English department there, which was good. They wouldn't let me do the poetry though. I want I wanted to do the poetry and she said, No, I'm head of the department, I want to do the poetry. So she <laughs> did the poetry, I did the theatre. And very cleverly that year, just how we were reading I don't know if it was my choice or their choice, we were reading Arthur Miller's um Death of a Salesman. And just quite by chance it came on at the new theatre. And um We all went to see that. But teaching poetry, the teaching, I don't know that you can teach poetry, the teaching of poetry. I, I'm very, very, I'm perhaps over keen on saying I don't like that line or shove that word out the window or that's just a cliche. I'm too, maybe I have hurt some people's feelings in the past. But I'm very, I, I, I but I mean, what I'm saying is that. Uh, within the circle of kind of local young local poets and emerging poets that I know of um, you are very well respected as someone to look up to um, and what you say any feedback you have tends to be uh, accepted with sort of you know uh, as as almost sort of guidance really and uh, um, and and how do you feel about that aspect I mean I'm not talking about formal Teaching well, I sometimes kind of wonder if my, my criticism isn't just entirely negative. I mean, very often you get you get you get the chance to say I, I don't like that line very much, but don't really get much chance to say what uh, how to improve it, if indeed you know how to do that to say that. But um, so possibly I'm too quick to con to um, criticise uh, negatively. I'm sure there are you find people who will tell you that that's true. I think Nick Fisk probably would tell you that's true. Um. But I think the what you see as negative sort of you know and and criticism. I think these are uh, my own impression is that these are sort of accepted as a valued observation from. Uh, an experienced poet, and I don't think that they see negatively. Well, I'd, I'd like to think you were right in a test because uh, it's, um, well, I, you know, I'm, I feel flattered by what you say and take it with a pinch of salt, if I may. <laughs> This one, I, I don't know, I really like this one. I think I've read it before at a reading somewhere. But it's, I took the, f the first two verses were, um, I wrote years ago. And I've always wanted to get a third verse and I couldn't, I tried this and I tried that and I tried the other. And finally, last spring, I think I got it right. 
Shall I read it now? Yes, please, yes, yes. Now, it's called Now. Now. Strange to think resourceful time will buffet to a golden gleam, this now, this day's end, looking out at the rain, wondering whether to go out or put my head in the gas oven. Strange to think this stash of rain and pub and Friday night will one day be the golden days, and sure as shepherd's pie will cry, Lord, but life was good back then. Strange to think hot tears will flow, one day when I bring to mind this winter night, alone with the HP sauce, listening to the wind and rain, knowing it will never come again. And, uh... So, um, what are you working on at present, uh, whether it's poetry or any other projects? Poetry, yeah, poetry. I, I, I found this, um, this, uh, uh, coronavirus business. I don't know why it was. I put down my pen book last spring before last. I said, oh, I'm not going to bloody well write anymore. My days of poetry are finished. I can't live with that, though. I, I, I'm bursting with poetry. It's, it sounds a bit crappy to say that, but I, I do. I do lines and ideas pop into my head. Not as frequently as I'd like them to, actually. Ideas particularly, but certainly lines come into my head, non sequiturs generally. Uh, I'll read um, The Aunts yes. in here. I'll read The Aunts, which is a memory of a funeral. Of, uh, <coughs> And it's a poem, one, uh, this, this little funny, this, this poem. I remember there was a Welsh, there was a Welsh edition of um, uh, Orbis magazine, and I was invited to contribute something, I think edited by Peter Finch, and I was invited to contribute something. And then uh, the editor of the Orbis magazine has a little competition about the fav their, their, her readership's favourite poem, and I tied first with um, Julian Clark. Oh. So, <laughs> with this poem, which I thought was jolly... Uh, Jolly good. So I got I got a bit of money for that apparently. Uh, somewhere, not very much, I don't think. I have the pleasure of being in a master class with uh, Gillian Clark. Uh, What's she like as a person? Wonderful. Is she really okay? Absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, but I guess the experience as a kind of as a mentee may be different to uh, to to a contemporary. So uh, so for me, she uh, she helped me immensely. Oh, to good to craft my poems and to kick out the archaic out of me. Kick the archaic out, yeah, Absolutely. good, yeah, kick the archaic out as soon as you can. Um, the Aunts, 25. Now, this is a memory of a funeral. This is actually a slight little diversion, but um, 25. Uh, this was uh, the funeral of um, an uncle, the husband, where the bloody hell is it? Oh, yeah. The husband of uh, um, my aunt, my, my mother's younger sister, Jennifer Dawson, who uh, wrote a book called The Ha Ha back in the 60s that won some big prize or other. I remember it quite clearly. The aunts. So, I, I come from a sort of, a sort of, pro, a sort of mini matriarchy. Most of the women in my family are stronger than the men. It always struck me, it strikes me still. They're mostly dead now, there is one of the sisters still alive. But uh, my mother and her sisters, of, which, whom, of whom Jenny was one, uh, were and are, well, were and still to one, 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 one remains anyway, quite strong characters. The aunts. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> Pine clad down the singing chapel. Another uncle that I barely knew flows out into the afternoon to start a new life underground or scattered somewhere dear to him. The organ wheezes as we step from creaking pews into the sun, where someone waves and over there, mob handed, stand the merry aunts plotting pubs and latest trains. So in the city arms saloon we drink away the afternoon. Toasting the uncle newly dead 
and those of us still pushing on, till suddenly it's later than we thought, the aunts and cousins behind prams are waving back while running hard for waiting trains. And later, in the corner of a crowded carriage, I look out at the passing darkness and think about the unknown uncles falling like a view of trees, and of the aunts, now newly strange, rising behind them like a mountain range. Wonderful. How did the sort of uh, how did the coronavirus sort of affect your um, your writing process? You know, obviously the world would have been a lot quieter. Did that help or? No, I can't pretend it did. I don't. I don't know. Noise isn't generally a distraction, particularly. I can generally block my ears when I'm trying to write something, that, and somebody says, "John, John, listen, look at this. Listen to that. Oh, shut up. I'm trying to write something." But um, uh, I think what it was, was everybody who ever wrote anything suddenly started writing about coronavirus. And um, I didn't want to do that. Particularly, I, for some reason. I did start, I, I, that's right, later that summer I went to Wrexham and went for a trawl around North Wales. And I remember trying to write about Wrexham. It's the city I love, actually. One of the most interesting cities I've been in. It's when I think of North Wales, I think Wrexham, explore East Wales, and then, as I did last summer, cross over to um, Dolgetlai and you can explore the other side of Wales. Then, on the, well, the bus pass. Bus. What, what makes Wrexham so interesting? I think because it is a city that clearly had been through really rough times. The only, funnily enough. The only place that seems to be thriving is the <laughs> is the weather spoons. Uh, that really is thriving. But uh, the city's half shut down. A lot of the shops are shut, and yet there's something. Where I bet a lot of friendly people. You know, they're very friendly people. I've met them. Well, not. I'm sure there are friendly people everywhere. But I did seem to tumble into their company, and then it's a it's a good for a good hub. You can zoom up to. Flintshire and have a look at that very unexplored part of Wales, North East Wales, which um, is something of a revelation, really, of Flint and Mould and um, all that sort of Denbigh, Dinbich, etc. Are you planning to write about it or have you written about her? I've written several, uh, uh, well, uh, have I really written about it? No, I haven't really, really written about it. Um, as I said, I tried to put some poems together about Wrexham, some ideas together about Wrexham. I've got a long, sort of, uh, not the least bit interesting piece of stuff uh, about, about alleyways, I think, mainly, and Turkish or Kurdish restaurants. I had a very friendly Kurdish restaurant, restaurateur there. Uh, yes, it's um, and all the surrounding countryside is very nice too. You can look out across, look east, and sense the mountains of middle of Wales and West Wales. Go down to Clangotlan and take the bus across through um, Abala and down to Dolgetlai, which is fabulous. It's very important. The the, the 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 important thing is the bus pass. Right. Reach 60 and, you know, the only good thing about getting old is that bloody bus pass. <laughs> you seem to be a very fond traveller. Um, how has the sort of your experience of wandering around impacted your poetry? Well, I've got a love of some French poetry. In R Rambo is an early love, and I still do rather love the man, even though he's a bit, he, he, he seems to be everybody's love. But his angry and um, grumpy stalking off and having nothing to do with morbid poetry and to Africa and Harrah was um, a 
and all his brilliant poems, his drunken boats and pictures of Paris. I remember I, got, I went to, I was on a train in France, in Eastern, I, for some reason I was in Besançon, on a train. And so I thought, where should I go now? I, I was I'm on my way home, and I had a ticket that was one of those round Spain and Portugal and France tickets for fortnight. And the ticket was just about to run out, so I'll go and have a night in, I'll go to um, Charleville, where Rambo is from. And I remember getting off the train in Charleville, and the little tiny gardens, sandy little gardens, as they quite often are in France. And I remember thinking, sitting in that little garden, thinking, well, Rambo almost certainly sat here. And this is the road that he would have walked down going to Paris, you know. And I went, I took a night's lodgings. And next day, I went down to see the famous Rambo Museum, which was disappointing. It wasn't really a great deal there. They did their best with the school reports and p police reports and prison <laughs> and uh, all those sorts of reports. But, uh, so yes, Rambo was a, a very, I think he was a very early in fact, for instance, I mean, Dylan Thomas was uh, mad, he called himself the Rambo of Cundonkin Drive, didn't he? And I, I think um, Dylan and people, Bob Dylan and people like that were uh, influenced by Rambo. It's the mythology, it's all, a lot of it's mythology which is understandable, we are human beings and, and stuffed with myth. So there you go. Okay, well thank you very much John for your time.